I want to thank all of our participants in the worship service this morning. Thank you to the readers. Where's Catherine? Thank you, Catherine. I love this move. Thank you. I hope I can give you that after I'm done. <laughs> okay. Now, how many of you are familiar with the parable of the prodigal sheep? Have you heard of the prodigal sheep before? Have you? Now, if Jill Honus were here, I call her the Department of Corrections because she would be good to keep uh, Greg on track if you ever uh, misspoke uh, something. But this is not a mistake. The parable of the prodigal sheep goes something like this. There was a boy who grew up watching a flock of sheep play together. The boy loved the curving horns on top of the sheep, the heads of the sheep. And the boy's dad would take the boy and his brother every once in a while to this very large sheep pen where the sheep with the curving horns would play with other animals like bears and horses and birds and also some other creatures including cowboys and Vikings. One day when the boy was a little older, the group of sheep moved from their pen in Los Angeles down to another one in Anaheim. And every year, because he was older, he would drive and make the longer trip to go see the sheep with the curving horns play. But it wasn't the same in the sheep pen in Anaheim. Then, years later, the sheep moved even farther away, halfway across the country. This made the boy, who was now a young man, very sad because he now had two sons of his own and he wanted and wished that he could take them to the sheep pen in Los Angeles to watch the sheep with the curving horns play just like his dad had done with him. But he couldn't because the sheep didn't play there anymore. Many years passed. And even though the man watched the sheep from a distance, it just wasn't the same. It wasn't that the sheep were lost. He knew where they were. They were in St. Louis. <laughs> they just weren't home. Then a remarkable thing happened. The sheep with the curving horns left St. Louis and came back to Los Angeles. <laughs> and not just Los Angeles, but to the very same sheep pen where the man first saw them play. This made the man very happy. <laughs> he was there with 90,000 other people who celebrated the return of the sheep. And this November, he will take his sons, who are now young men, to watch the sheep with the curving horns play in the large sheep pen. <laughs> the Los Angeles Rams have come home, and as I sat in the sold out Memorial Coliseum, watching them play in their old blue and yellow uniforms, I felt a profound sense of restoration. At long last, the Rams are back where they belong. Now, I know this might surprise some of you, but you won't find that parable of the prodigal sheep in your Bible. But you will find in Luke 15, three stories that are very similar to it. And if you'll humor me with one more Los Angeles sports reference, here it is. This whole season, uh, the baseball community at large and the Los Angeles community in particular has been celebrating Vin Scully, who's been the Dodgers announcer for 67 years. You know him, you know that voice. 
But in addition to his graciousness and his humility and his wit, one of the things that we love about Venn is his great gift for storytelling. Well, do you know who else was a fantastic storyteller? That's right, you can say it, it's Jesus. Jesus was a gifted, fantastic storyteller. He used situations and references that his audience, that his audiences understood. He didn't talk over their heads, he didn't talk under them, he used references that they would get from their own lives. And people, whether they were strangers, whether they were friends, or whether they were enemies, they hung on every word. In one of his sermon series, Pastor Tony Werfel of OC Grace First SDA Church in Garden Grove, he noted the difference in the way that Greeks and Hebrews learned. Learned about lots of things, but also learned about God. I'm paraphrasing, but his point was that the Greek mind learned from information and from wisdom and from logic. He said that the Hebrew mind learned through stories. The example he gave was that if you told seven different stories about God, you would have a richer understanding of his character than you would if you only heard one story. In his book, Searching for a God to Love, Chris Blake tells a Jewish folktale in which the Lord God is trying to decide who his chosen people will be. He first interviews the Greeks, asking them, what could you do for me? The Greeks promise God the finest art and loftiest thinking. Then he interviews the Romans, who promise great buildings and wonderful road systems. After traveling around the world, interviewing one nation after another, he interviews a small Middle Eastern group. Lord God, the Jewish people respond, we aren't known for our, 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 for our arts or power or roads. However, we are a nation of storytellers. If you were to be our God and we were to be your people, we could tell your story throughout the world. It's a deal, says God. And the rest is his story. Jesus' stories aren't just interesting and they're not just relatable. They had and they have a point. So, before we listen to the three stories that he tells in Luke 15, we have to know why it is that he told these stories in the first place. And the answers are found in the very first two verses of Luke 15. We heard them read. You can follow along with me. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Interesting. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Wow. Let's just take a moment to consider how messed up that is. The Pharisees who knew the law inside and out were supposedly spiritual guides, but they looked down on common people who weren't as educated as they were. They had this great sense of entitlement. They weren't necessarily interested in God's righteousness, but they were very interested in the righteousness they could project because they knew laws and kept laws very well. The teachers of the law should have been guiding others to what the law, to whom the law pointed to, to the character of God. And this is how, when they are in the presence of the Son of God, the same Son of God who said that all the law and the prophets could be summed up in these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In the presence of that Son of God, they found God's behavior unacceptable. 
Wow. So how would you have responded if you were Jesus and you heard them say that? Because you know he heard them muttering that. Would you have said, yeah, I do welcome sinners and I do eat with them. Isn't it great? Or would you have said, you guys are the worst. You're supposed to be drawing people closer to God and you're pushing them away instead. Or would you have said, I'm sorry, did you say something? I couldn't hear you over the sound of you patting yourself on the back so loudly. <laughs> Jesus didn't say any of these things. Instead, he told three stories. And as you listen to the stories that he tells, I hope that you'll be thinking about what collectively the stories tell us about God. First one starts in verse 3, if you're following along in Luke 15. Luke 15, verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Is that a great story? Do you catch the detail in that? Which of you, if you have nine, if you have a hundred sheep and loses one of them, he asks the question, he says, wouldn't you go after the sheep? But would you? Wouldn't some of you think, eh, 99 out of 100, that's pretty good. That's good. Not this person in the story. No, not one of the sheep is disposable. Did you catch the detail about what he does when he finds the sheep? Picks it up, puts it on his shoulders, walks home. What a picture that Jesus is painting with his words. He doesn't yell at the sheep. He doesn't hit it with a stick the whole way home. Picks it up in a loving way, puts it on his shoulders, carries it home, and when he gets back home, what does he do next? Calls his friends to celebrate. God wants to bring lost people back where they belong. The irony of this story is that he's contrasting it with 99 others who don't need to repent. At the end of his story, he doesn't leave us hanging. He's using this analogy, this parable, to make a larger point. And he does that by connecting it with, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. So this is a story about sheep hunting, searching, finding, but it's talking about people. It's talking about us. And he's saying over the 99 that don't need to repent, who's he talking to? He's talking to some who don't think that people who aren't like them are even worth hanging around or having lunch with. The irony there. So I have a question for you. When you hear Jesus telling this story, where do you put yourself in it? Are you the 99 or are you the one? If the Pharisees and teachers of the law that are muttering knew Ezekiel and the prophecies that he gave, this parable would have evoked the verses that we heard in our Old Testament scripture. And you can find those. You can probably find it faster than I can get there. Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 11. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. So why does God go after the strays and the lost sheep?
Because what? They're his. He cares about them. In this instance, why does he have to go after the lost sheep, the lost people? For the answer, we can read that if we start all the way back to the start of Ezekiel 34. So stay with me. Going back to the first verse of that chapter, we're going to find out why it's necessary for this rescue mission to even happen in the first place. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, and I'm reading it in Ezekiel 34, verse 1. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, you clothe yourselves with wool, and you slaughter the choice animals. But you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered, because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains, and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Hmm. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds, and I will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths, and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations, gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in a good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture in the mountains of Israel. Is anyone else catching the Psalm 24 connection? It makes me lie down. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. When shepherds, leaders, become more interested in their own gain than with the spiritual development of those who are entrusted to them, they're as lost as anyone else. And when shepherds won't go out and find the lost sheep, God will. Story two. Back to Luke 15. Starting in verse 8. Story one is about the lost sheep and the shepherd who goes out and finds it. Story two. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me because I found my coin, my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels, of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, this parable probably resonates a little bit more with my brother Eric than it does with me because he used to collect coins. And he could tell you the difference of a coin made in a certain year and what mint it was made in, and he could also know what gave it value. This coin has enough value that the woman is going to sweep for it, probably has to light a lamp because it wouldn't have been easy to see otherwise. The woman searches for her lost coin. So you would think, depending on the coin, aren't still got nine coins. Isn't nine out of ten okay? Not to the woman. That coin was not disposable. She had to go find it. 
And when she finds it, what does she do? Rejoices and she doesn't do it alone. She wants others to share in her joy. The coin was back where it belonged. Okay, when you hear that story, do you imagine that you're one of the nine coins that are still on the dresser? Or are you that one coin that fell off and is behind the dresser? Two stories in, are you getting a picture of God? Story three, starting in verse 11. Jesus, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate, which is a bold and disrespectful thing to ask for, because that's pretty much the will. That's pretty much your inheritance. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And then there's the older son. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father says, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. What a storyteller. There's so much going on here. We talked about the disrespect of the youngest son. Uh, I'm, I've learned that probably the property, the dad's property probably would have been two shares of it, portions of it would have gone to the oldest firstborn. One share would have gone to the younger son. So he's pretty much getting a third of everything that the father has. The idea is, I'd rather have your stuff than time with you, than a relationship with you. The father does not deny this disrespectful request, but he grants it to him. And when the son's stuff, when his money runs out, and there's a famine, the story says he comes to his senses. He understands not only where he's at, but he seems to have a sense of the magnitude of his actions. Because as he's realizing that his dad's servants eat better than he does, he realizes, I'm not worthy to, what I did was so disrespectful, I'm not worthy to be called your son, make me one of your servants. He does something important. He turns back to his father and he heads toward home. And the father 
is out looking for him. Doesn't just wait for him to come all the way. He sees him before he even gets all the way home and goes out running after him. And he doesn't go out there running after him so he can shake his, wag his finger in his face. You heard the description. Hugs him. Kisses his neck. And then the son's starting into his monologue. At least the son seems to get a sense that this disrespectful thing hasn't just been done against his father, but it's also a sin against God. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And that's as much as he gets out. And the father says, let's celebrate. The older son isn't as glad to see the younger son. He doesn't come into the party. He doesn't come into the party and say, Dad, what are you doing? He's angry. He stays angry. And what does the dad do with him? He goes out to the older son. Why are you angry? And what the older son has to say kind of gives away what his intentions are. If he missed his younger brother and was concerned about his welfare, you'd think he'd be happier to see him. But if he's keeping score, he's saying, I've been here this whole time. I've done what you've said. You haven't given me this. You haven't get, and now he comes back. And, and boy, the son has a pretty clear description of how the younger son blew the money. Didn't you hear? That he tells more of a detail about what the younger son did than, the, than Jesus tells in his original story. Maybe he's got the wishes that he were doing the same thing. Whatever his intentions are, he's not that thrilled that the younger son has been welcomed back and not only received, but restored. This is the detail of these three stories that speaks directly back to the complaint that Jesus heard the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttering. They probably would have heard themselves in the older brother. I won't ask you which one you are this morning, but they, this detail of the story was intended for them. If their picture of God's love wasn't broad enough, if their circle wasn't broad enough to include sinners and have supper and lunch with them, their circle wasn't big enough. And here's a spoiler alert. We're all lost at some point, sooner or later. You're all That sheep, I'm that coin, we're that younger brother at some point. Isaiah 53, 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Romans 3, 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when you think about it, there are lots of ways that we can be lost or get lost. It might be lost for an afternoon. It might be lost for a week. It might be lost for two months. We can be lost in fear. We can be lost in grief. We can be lost in doubt. We can be lost in self-righteousness or self-pity. We can even become lost in the busyness of everyday life or in our own ambition. But the good news, the gospel, is that Jesus lived and died and lives again so that we don't have to stay lost. No matter how we get there, we're never so lost that God can't find us. And our hope of making it home rests in Christ alone. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And then I want us to look at John 10, 11 through 16. Jesus' words again, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. 
The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have sheep men, other, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Is that good news? Here are three things that I hope you can take away this morning. One, if you feel lost for any reason, listen for the good shepherd's voice. Two, if you feel lost for any reason, do what the younger son did. Turn back to the father and start walking toward home. Number three, God doesn't just want to find us. He wants to restore us completely, abundantly, and joyfully. He celebrates with all of heaven when he brings us home. And that celebration dwarfs anything that could ever happen in the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. (laughs) Because his prodigal sheep are back in the fold. His sons and daughters who were lost are now found, and we are back where we belong.